Hi, I'm going to give a quick introduction to the spring problem. Uh, we have a discussion that we've recorded, but to access uh, access this spring problem, just open up your internet browser, go to apmonitor.com, and visit the optimization course. And then this optimization course, uh, this will have the information on the spring problem. So if you go down to the spring design link, uh, right here on the right hand side, see spring design. Uh, there's a little bit of information here, but you'll need to get the PDF uh, per version for the full uh, the full assignment. Okay, then once you load this, we're going to be talking just a little bit about uh, this spring design problem with um, with Frank and Arthur today. So um, if you have any questions, uh, you can also post your questions or also uh, you know, discussions about this problem on the very bottom. Go ahead and just uh, post a comment. You can log in with uh, a variety of different um, uh, web services uh, that you want. Um, so anyway, go ahead and post here. There may be some other comments down here as you as you work on this. Just as a as a general uh, word of caution, this one is a little bit more complicated than the previous one, than the two bar truss. So uh, you'll make sure you, you give yourself adequate time to work through the equations and to understand them for this spring design problem. So, so here's just a, uh, I'll just give a quick overview of this and then we'll dig into, into more details. You're trying to design this spring system with uh, the number of coils, uh, the coil diameter, and then also the wire diameter and then also the free height as well. So, so those parameters can be changed uh, for the spring design to try to meet constraints and minimize, uh, or maximize in this case, maximize the preload height uh, for this, this spring problem. So we'll go over to the discussion now. We're just going to do a, an informal session here and, and uh, you know, just kind of walk through the spring design problem. And, and talk a little bit about the equations. Frank, you know, you've been, been through this already, so if you have anything in particular that uh, you want to mention about it, um, you know, then feel free to in, and, uh, kind of give an introductory overview of this problem. Well, uh, I said last time, I thought, you know, you had to figure out, you know, you got the force as a function of height, and then you got the stress as a function of force. So you had to, so I had to combine those to get the stress as a function of height. Otherwise, it was mostly a matter of just finding all the different pieces and putting them together. Okay. Great. Well, let, let's go ahead and just um, go through it. We have a, uh, you know, specifications and equations for this compression spring. So we're going to do the optimal design of a compression spring. Um, we want to determine, so this is the objective, determine the spring design uh, that maximizes the force of a spring at its preload height. Okay, so preload height um, h naught of one inch. Okay, um, so there's, uh, it's going to operate, it's going to operate uh, indefinite over times through a deflection of 0.4 inches. Okay, so those distances are, are going to be important here, um, which is an additional deflection from H naught. Okay, so there's a, a preload height, um, and then it's going to operate uh, through uh, deflection of 0.4 inches uh, many times. So also, as, as Frank mentioned, um, you know, there's a constraint here. Stress at the solid height, HS, must be less than SY to protect the spring from inadvertent damage. Okay, so you have to have this, that, that's one constraint that many people might miss on this problem. Um, and and the challenge with this, Frank, why don't you just go ahead and say that again, because I, I liked what you said about the challenge of this problem. Well, I see your, a lot of your constraints involve the stress. And, you know, the stress is given to you as a function of force. And then the force is separately given as a function of height, and also the spring constant has to be calculated. Okay, good. Well, um, so 
so so you have some functions that cannot be isolated. You can't just explicitly calculate Or as uh, Frank, you did it in Mathematica. You declared some functions, and then I just made these these extra variables um, kind of like functions. Um, so the the design of the spring, we're going to be able to vary uh, these five parameters right here. Uh, the the free height, okay? You have a preload height. That's a, those are actually the preload height. It's actually uh, uh, set to one inch, as you saw above. Um, you have the number of coils in the spring and the coil diameter and then the wire diameter as well. Those are all uh, design variables or decisions that can be made to uh, meet the objectives and stay within the constraints of this problem. Okay, so there's some other uh, variables and functions uh, here. You have the deflection from preload height. Okay, that's the delta naught. Uh, the deflection, deflected height, h def. So, so here you see a diagram of the of the springs. Okay, so uh, this is the preload height right here. That's going to be one inch right there, and uh, you want to try to maximize the force of the spring uh, at this preload height here. And this is the this is the amount of deflection here, the four inches that we talked about above. And so your force is going to be this deflection times K. So if you remember from physics class, Arthur, do you remember this physics class? The force equals a spring constant times delta X? Yeah. So, so you may have to go back in your physics book. I know I had to on this problem. I had to. It's, it's linear. The force, the additional force um, that comes from uh, the spring is a function of the spring constant times the, the delta x of the uh, you know of, of the compression uh, of the spring. So this delta x here, the force is going to be the, the nominal force at the at the uh, the preload height plus this uh, you know deflected amount times your spring constant uh, k. It's actually a spring stiffness. Okay. Um, and then the thing that you can't have is, is clashing. So if you, uh, you know, have a, uh, a certain amount of force, these, these wires will actually touch and, that, and that's also undesirable. So we have some, some equations for the stress, uh, of the spring. Um, and, and I'll go, I'll just go through those equations as well. Okay. So you have the, uh, the spring stiffness. Uh, this K value, you know, that's a function of the wire diameter and then also the coil diameter and also the number, the number of coils that you have. Here's a, a modulus of, uh, uh, is that a, a Young's modulus or a modulus of elasticity of, of some sort? And, uh, you can see it's, uh, it's a, a nonlinear relationship. Okay, so, yeah, so G is the, the shear modulus. Okay, so the stress, the stress in the spring uh, with this force, with a force F, um, is going to be equal to this equation here. So as you, as you increase the diameter of the spring, um, you know, this, this, uh, this stress becomes less, okay, less the cube. Um, so as the force increases, the stress increases linearly. And the diameter also is uh, affecting that as well. Okay, so that's the uh, stress in the spring. Uh, we also have a K value. You saw a K value here. The K value is defined down here at the wall factor. Um, so it accounts for the stress concentration due to the curvature of the spring, um, as well as the uh, direct shear. Okay, so here's another uh, you know, relationship between the diameter of the spring um, and the diameter of the wire and this uh, wall factor. Okay, so the solid height, uh, this one's just very straightforward. This is just the number of coils that you have times the diameter of your spring. So if we go back up to the top, um, you know, it's just counting the number of coils uh, times the, the diameter of the spring, and that's your HS or your solid height. Okay. Um, let's see, is, is the spring, uh, these, 
these are the fatigue criteria here. These two, this one uh, that uh, so the, the material does not fail in fatigue, and then and, uh, these are the the mean stress t, tau m, and then uh, tau a is alternating shear stress. Okay, uh, and those are all defined here. The tau max, uh, tau min divided by two. That's the that's the mean, and then the alternating shear stress. Um, we're going to have tau max minus tau min divided by two. Okay, so so that's going to be the uh, you're going to get those taus because um, you, know, you were given that you have nominal height of one inch and then deflection of 0.4, and so you'll know the the uh, tau values, uh, the tau values here at those different heights because you'll have the different uh, forces at the uh, you know, the different heights. Okay, so let me go down. Arthur, do you have any questions about this model so far? I don't want to go too fast through it. That's okay. I think it's pretty clear. I open it in my computer as well, so I can read this. Okay, great. Let, let's keep going then. Um, now this is the the S Y. This is the yield strength. Okay, now remember we had a, a constraint all the way at the top. Um, you know, the, the stress at the solid height must be less than SY to protect the spring from inadvertent damage. That's where this this uh, value is going to come in. So you're going to uh, compute the stress at solid height, um, and that has to be less than SY. So SY is, is defined down here, the yield strength. Okay, so also we have a, a, a ratio, okay, the diameter uh, of the spring divided by the diameter of the wire. So that has to be between 4 and 16, okay? So you can't have something that's very skinny wire, very, very large diameter, or very, very fat wire, very small uh, coil diameter. It has to be between those range. Diameters uh, of the wire, we have a, a choice. In, in, some cases we might have, um, you know, the diameter of the wire might be in discrete values, but in this case we're just assuming that it's a continuous decision variable. Okay, then um, we have the uh, some allowable width for the spring. Okay, now that is going to be the uh, diameter of the coil uh, plus the diameter of the wire. Okay, and that's going to be uh, point, less than 0.75 inches. Okay, um, then a clash allowance. Okay, so we don't want it to get too close to the solid height. So it has to be at least 0 0.05 inches away from the solid height um, when it when it's uh, going through its deflection cycles. Okay, um, you know, a lot of constraints here, a lot of uh, nonlinear relationships. You know. It's a, Kind of an interesting, uh, interesting problem. It took it took me a while to just set it up and get it get it working as well. Frank, how long did it take you? Oh, I think I probably spent over an hour just getting all the equations set up. Okay, so it might take uh, an hour or more to uh, get the equations set up for this problem. Um, the one thing I do provide uh, down below is a sample design. Okay, so you can check your equations with this sample design. Go ahead and plug in your wire diameter, your coil diameter, your coil number, and then pre-height as well. And then you should get uh, these these values of the uh, you know the the values of the you know some of them are constraints or uh, you know we call them analysis functions. Uh, we're also going to be using these as constraints that are going to be binding as well. But you can check your model. If you'll just plug in this design, and you should receive uh, these results uh, if you plug that in. Okay, so um, report, you know, three pages, uh, a little bit like the two-bar one, you know, summary, procedure, um, you know, give a, a table of all of your variables, your, your degrees of freedom. Okay, so these analysis variables are like the parameters of your model, the things that are fixed that you really don't change. Uh, these are your degrees of freedom, the ones that you're going to vary to optimize the solution. Analysis functions, those are, uh, you know, just the functions that you're calculating to 
determine the uh, you know the stresses, and then design functions are going to be those that are going to be using constraints, um, and also then the objective function as well. Okay, and then uh, you get a report with the uh, optimal values, and uh, you know, discuss uh, you know discuss the um, you know the optimal uh, solution. Um, you know, one of the ways that we can we can do that is to generate a contour plot, and that helps to you know just be able to see uh, you know graphically. The, the disadvantage of the contour plot is that you have to have um, you know it's a 2D uh, surface. Okay, so that's it. Uh, I think uh, in terms of the model, that's all I was going to describe. And uh, my family just got home, so. <laughs> My kids just got home, so it'd be a little bit more noisy in here. But uh, anyway, okay. Well, that that was it, Arthur. Um, Arthur, are you using Python or are you using MATLAB? I prefer to use MATLAB. Okay. So, so one of the other things I just posted, you know, we in class we talked about um, parallel uh, parallel algorithms. And uh, if you go down to activities, I put in uh, a couple links to parallel computing. And um, you know, so here, here are some files from MATLAB to run optimization problems in parallel on you know, multiple processors. And then this is the example in Python. So um, anyway, you, if you want to download these, you can play with them. This one in Python, uh, you know, I was able to do. Um, you know, greatly speed up the uh, the calculations because they, uh, especially for some of these um, where you're trying to re-optimize with different parameter values. So anyway, um, and and then there's a little video there with the uh, MATLAB as well.